evening, everyone, and welcome to the Party for the Peregrines. My name is Jeff Hall, and this is Audubon's annual fundraiser to help the care of 13 birds of prey that we call the Audubon Ambassadors. But it's more than just birds of prey. We have two ravens, we have a grackle, we have snakes, turtles, we even have a millipede. These animals have all been injured in some way, so it is our responsibility to take care of them for housing, food, their medical health, and well-being. And we use these ambassadors in our school programs, at libraries, at our own special events, to help connect us all with the natural world. If you ever seen a millipede get its temperature taken, it's an itty bitty little thermometer. It's pretty impressive. Not only that, we're going to be raising funds for our Peregrine webcam and also for the thousands and thousands of acres that we protect all over the state of Rhode Island. So thank you for being here tonight to learn about what Audubon does, how we take care of these amazing birds, and how you can help support us. So what a year it's been. I never thought would we, be, we would be doing another virtual party for the Peregrines. I don't know about you, but I kind of thought by the end of last summer this was all going to be over. <laughs> Silly me. Last year at this time when the world was shutting down, we had to close our nature center. All the school programs were being canceled. We had to shut down summer camp. And quite frankly, I didn't have a great feeling of how things were going to turn out. And I know many of us have gone through some tough times this past year, and our heart goes out to everyone who's lost a loved one, a, a friend, a colleague. And we just have to pray that this never happens again. But even in those dark clouds, there were rays of hope. Over the last year, more people have discovered the Audubon refuges than ever before. Heck, it only took a pandemic. I know guys who live right down the road from a refuge and had never been there before. Throughout the year, Audubon has been blessed with an incredible outpouring of support. And while many nonprofits had to cut back, had to cut back or reduce services, we've actually grown over the last 12 months. Starting last May, with the help of donors, our education department pivoted from in-person education programs to virtual online. And we provided a hours of content on our Audubon at Home series, as well as programs for schools and libraries. And the demand has been overwhelming. And now we're actually going back into the classrooms and our education staff is rising to that challenge. We saved an additional 100 acres of protected open space this year down in South County. And with the leadership of Meg Kerr, our Senior Director of Policy, we even pal helped pass the most significant environmental law in the last decade, Act on Climate. None of this would have been possible, even remotely, without the support we were given from you and all our members. So from all of us, thank you. I once said going out in nature was a luxury to some, but I think we all know over the past year, nature is now a necessity. I think not only for the birds and wildlife that live on the refuges, but for our own health and mental well-being. We need nature now more than ever. So I think we should celebrate, and I think we should raise a shot to all of you that have supported Audubon, protected birds and wildlife, and have kept this a great organization on the cutting edge. Now, I know this might not be the shot you were expecting, but if you haven't gotten one of these or its little miniature versions, please go out and get a vaccine so we can be back together again safe and, and have some fun, and we never have to do, do this party for the peregrines virtually again. And I know Hamilton isn't going to like this, but I am throwing away my shot. We got a big night ahead of us. We're going to learn about how we take care of these raptors. We're going to meet our very own peregrine falcon. We're going to learn a little bit about the Superman building. We're going to talk to people who have actually banded peregrines in the past. We're going to close out our auction and we're going to pick the golden ticket raffle winner. We have some amazing items in our auction. And if you haven't been signed, haven't signed up to be a bidder yet, it takes 60 seconds. Go do it now. I can see over here on our bidding computer that the bidding is fast and furious. And remember, every dollar we make tonight is going to our Raptor program. And I know you might say, Jeff, hey, I'm a Marie Kondo follower and I don't need any more stuff that doesn't bring me joy. So in that case, go click that big red button that says donate and make a donation tonight. Every dollar we raise is going to go to our Raptors. So please, and if you, don't, if you want to do it later on today, Go to asri.org slash donate, and you can do that at any time tonight. And now I'd like to introduce Larry Taft, the Executive Director of the Audubon Society. Thank you to Jeff Hall and all the Audubon staff, volunteers, and donors who helped create this virtual event. Tonight you will see some of the Raptors that the Audubon Education staff 
use in our programs. Now imagine you are a fifth grader from a city school and one of these birds visits your classroom. Would we have your attention? By supporting our Raptors in School programs, you are giving students the wonderful opportunity to share in this wonderful experience. Kids learn about birds, their adaptations, behavior, and ecology through inquiry-based learning experiences that align with and support state educational standards. The Perrican webcam is also part of this, a successful recovery story right in our own capital city. Widespread use of DDT starting in the 1960s caused peregrines to be endangered and absent from anywhere east of the Mississippi River by the mid-1970s. The point of our programs is to instill a sense of caring for birds and the environment. This all costs money, not only for the food, shelter, and medical care for these birds, but for the salaries of our fine Audubon educators. So we're giving you this unique opportunity to help support our efforts to instill a sense of wonder and stewardship of nature in the next generation. Please take this opportunity now to help make a difference. And thank you for supporting the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. What? He's done? Hey, thank you, Larry. Larry is on a much needed vacation and he so generously took some time off to do that little film. So next time you see him, he's gonna be tanned, rested, and ready. And okay, I don't think he's watching tonight, so that little foot on the desk thing, just between you and me. Thanks. What's it take to take care of 13 birds of prey? Kim Kilcagno, our refuge manager and animal specialist, is gonna take us behind the scenes to see how it all works. And warning, some of the video you're going to see with the birds feeding may be a little disturbing, especially if you like mice. Hi everybody, welcome to Powder Mill Ledges Wildlife Refuge. Uh, this is our caretaker house where a lot of our animal ambassador birds live. And we wanted to show you around a little bit today and show you what we do in the care of our birds. Uh, it's morning time right now, so we're going to do the morning feeding. And today actually is also uh, beaks and talons day. So come on inside, I'll show you around a little bit. So here we are inside the garage, which acts as our raptor care area uh, for day-to-day -day bird care. Uh, so if we come on in, one of the things you'll notice is that every bird has an area for itself. So um, we have carriers, one for each bird, and up on the wall, every bird has two sets of gloves. Um, we also have uh, big chest freezers, which is where we store the food. This year, we're actually hoping in the next few months that we're going to be doing some renovations in here and really upgrade this area to much more uh, bright and clean and modern space where we can do the raptor care. And you guys can, are definitely a part of that. All right, so it's time for morning feeding. Every day, uh, there's a morning feeding and a late afternoon feeding. And it's also the time that we prep any medications that we have. Today happens to be a mouse day. And so what I'm gonna do right now is prepare the mice that Ladyhawk and Chaplin get because their mice gets injected with their medications for the day. The first thing we do, I'm gonna open up this water. We will inject all the birds' food with water. And that's because in the wild, they get most of the water they need from the food they eat. They don't really go down to a pond and get a drink of water. They might bathe in a pond. Um, so we want to make sure they're getting enough to drink. So what I do is I just poke the needle into each food item, inflate it a little bit with water, and I do that for every single one. Make sure everybody gets enough to drink. Sometimes in captivity, when a bird has originally been injured, in the case of both of these birds, they had wing injuries, over time they can develop the same things that we do when we've had a knee or an elbow injury. They can develop arthritis and other issues. And so uh, these are pain medications to make sure they stay comfortable at all times. Certain days of the week is uh, vitamin day and so we have a vitamin supplement we put on the food just like you might take a multivitamin every day. Um, these guys get the multivitamin three times a week and it comes in a, a powder form and we just essentially put that on the food just like you're you're salting your dinner. 
So this has a lot of different vitamins. It's going to go on everybody's food a little bit here and there. And I'm going to take this tray and Webster's eye drops. So before I go out, I have to mark the log and note all the food we're going to give everybody today. Uh, and then we're going to go outside. So first thing every morning that we do is we give Webster one of his eye drops. He gets two different eye drops. They kind of have to be spaced out. So he's always the first thing I do and the last thing I do. Now Webster is one of our oldest birds. Last year, uh, one of his eyes was removed. So you'll notice he only has one eye now. We're trying to take care of the eye that's left. So we're making sure that tries to stay as healthy as possible. So as you might imagine, owls don't like eye drops just like humans don't really like eye drops. So I'm gonna give him a glove to sort of take out his aggravation on. He can hear where I am. Um, he's got amazing acute hearing. You gonna bite the glove? Get it out of your system? All right, you know, so mad. Can I give you an eye drop? Good boy. Absolutely no other bird that we have would just sit there and let me do an eye drop in his eye. Webster is the best boy. We'll be back in a few minutes and we're going to give you another eye drop, your favorite. Okay, so after Webster's eye drops, um, we're going to feed the red-tailed hawks. These are birds that are a little bit more excitable and a little bit more flighty, so we're going to see uh, if they'll come and take their food as they usually would. Alright, so we're going to go down in here. All of our cages um, have these nice vestibules. We were really fortunate last year uh, that we got a donation to replace uh, this vestibule, it had, it had been here for many, many years and it was starting to rot and so this was wonderful. We had some volunteers who came in and helped us tear off the old one and now we've got this beautiful new vestibule um, that keeps the birds safe whenever we want. We call it the airlock. We go inside and we close that behind us so it um, prevents any escaping. Hi, sweet girl. Lady has been here since 2004. She had a wing injury. She was found in Connecticut. Um, and she's probably one of our hungriest birds. She always acts like we've never fed her before. We'll put in her medicine food and her water filled food. And this is Chaplin. Chaplin um, was also found in Connecticut. He got his name because he was found in Chaplin, Connecticut. He also has an old wing injury. He's going to get his one medicine mouse and his water mouse. And he's just waiting patiently. Close the feed door. It's going to be such a party pooper. There you go. Good job, bud. So this is Zephyr, and Zephyr is a peregrine falcon. He is our newest bird to join our animal ambassadors. Once he started trusting us enough and, and started taking food from our hand, we've been hand feeding him every day. But we play a little game every morning where he has to jump from place to place until he's in his spot where he likes to take the food. Which way are you going? Let's go over here, okay. Will you take it from here? Go, no, this isn't the spot I like. Do we have to jump back over here first? Yep, we do. Don't jump on the floor though. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, go right up. Here we go. Oop. Poor wing. He does trip on it sometimes. All right, are we ready now? Here we go. Good boy. Oh. He dropped it on the floor. Now it has sand on it. Good boy. Don't drop it on the floor this time. So the only other thing we do in the morning is we check on all the other birds. So even if they don't get fed in the morning, we still give them a once over. We look, make sure everybody's healthy and happy. So uh, we're going to go inside and check on Miss Serena, who's our barred owl, and make sure she ate her food and make sure everything is okay with her. So hello, Miss Serena, how are you doing today? Here, I'll put your stuffed animal bunny up here. Yeah. We have different items we put in the cages for enrichment. And it uh, looks like you made a mess on your heating panel there, my love, to clean that off today too. Usually today would also be the day 
that we do a little cleaning. All right, now we're just gonna check on Queen Solomon. We call her Solly. She is our female great horned owl. The thing that amazes me always with Solly is she's a giant bird. She's about this big, but her ability to camouflage in her own cage is quite astounding. You can see how in the wild they look just like the bark of the trees. Very, very hard to discern as long as they sit still. She has uh, been in captivity for 24 years. She was found uh, by a lady as a tiny little fluffy chick out of the nest. And unfortunately, that lady kept her for too long before she brought her to a rehabilitator. And now, uh, forevermore, she is imprinted on humans. She, she's kind of stuck in baby mode. Um, and so she was unreleasable. Over the years, uh, when she lived at a rehab facility, she was a foster mama for a lot of babies. She's so beautiful, stunning, nothing wrong with her, but uh, because of that, the power that she wields in her beak and talons is really amazing. And today is the day we're gonna do beaks and talons. I like to call them beaky petties. It's necessary with captive birds often to trim the beak and their toenails, their talons, which grow just like our fingernails. They're made out of keratin and grow just like our fingernails do and just we have to pare our nails. We use trimmers like you would on a dog's toenails and we also use a Dremel tool to shape the beaks, shape the toenails in a way that is short enough, uh, helps us so we don't get pierced by talons, make sure the beaks are a shape that the birds can eat properly and can also uh, vocalize as they want to. Uh, in the wild, they would do this all on their own, but they need a little help sometimes in captivity. We always, at the same time, will weigh the birds, see how they're doing. We keep a log of their weight, um, and then we check their feet as well to make sure they're not getting any pressure sores on their feet in captivity. Because of their injuries and because they, most of them can't fly, uh, they sit a lot more often than they would in the wild. And so by watching their weight, and making sure their feet stay in good condition, uh, that can avoid a lot of problems, uh, sores that turn into infections and things like that. You're okay, how about, a, how about some water? What do you think? A little sip of water? A sip of water? Cool down. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. You have to wait till the mouse cooks because it don't taste good raw. It's not like sushi. Because that would be mushy. What? She's done? Thanks, Kim. That is so interesting. And like my friend James Bond would say, I'll take my mouse shaken, not hydrated. Hey, did I ever tell you we have an auction tonight? We have owl banding, mushroom walks, trips, adventures. Heck, you can even learn how to be a raptor handler with Kim. So go over to our auction site and bid, bid high, bid higher if you've been outbid already. It's all going to our Raptor program tonight, so please do your best shot there. Tonight, I want to introduce you for the first time to Zephyr, Audubon's first peregrine falcon. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us here at the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. We're gonna introduce you to our newest animal ambassador. This is Zephyr, and he is a peregrine falcon. And he has been with us for several months learning how to be in captivity once he got injured. So Zephyr was found in Stratford, Connecticut, and he was injured when he was chasing seabirds into a concrete seawall. He broke his right wing and you can probably notice his wing droops down quite a bit. They tried to repair it. It was so severely injured he's never going to be able to really use that wing or flap that wing again. Uh, but he has now come to live with us and be one of our educational ambassadors. Peregrine falcons are really amazing birds. 
If you didn't already know, they are one of the fastest animals on Earth, the fastest animal on Earth, and they have been clocked flying at speeds in their power dives up to 270 miles an hour. And as you can see, their wings are very pointed. Let's see if he'll let me show his little pointed wing. Their wings are very, very pointed. Their bodies are very slim and aerodynamic. And that's because when they go into that high speed power dive, they conform their body like a bullet and they dive at high speed and uh, can hit their prey very hard. Peregrines out in nature really like to live near cliffs and being near the shore is not surprising to find him there because a lot of coastal areas in New England have big cliffs. And so to find them, you might find them out on Block Island. Uh, but in the absence of big cliffs, they look for things that resemble big cliffs. Things like big, tall skyscrapers, also things like bridges. And so right here in Providence, we have a lot of peregrine falcons that can be seen around the city hunting. Peregrines are primarily bird eaters. And so uh, they will hunt things like pigeons and songbirds. They catch them right in the air as they're flying. They will dive bomb out of the sky at high speed power dives called a stoop. And that's when they go their absolute fastest and they will catch their prey and uh, pull them right out of the sky uh, without even landing. And they will catch their prey uh, with their feet primarily, but use that curved meat tearing beak to help them uh, eat their prey. To be in the falcon group, like a peregrine falcon, you um, have a special kind of notch in your beak. They have a kind of extra sharp tooth on the side called a nomial tooth, which helps them to break the neck of their prey as they're trying to dispatch it. Zephyr here is new to us, and when he came in, he was a completely wild bird. He uh, had never been handled, and once he was healed up, um, he didn't know how to sit on a glove like this, so he's been learning. Um, we started just being near him. Working with raptors, you have to build a lot of trust. So we, we would just go and sit in his cage with him. We would talk with him. We wanted him to get to know that we as his handlers were not gonna hurt him. He's always been a pretty calm dude. Um, so it's, he's made it kind of easy, but it took us many months sitting with him, sometimes reading to him, singing to him, getting closer and closer to him, never touching him. And then eventually we started to try to uh, offer him food from our hands. Slowly, slowly, he got used to that. And then very recently, um, over the last couple of months, uh, we have started to get him on the club. He's still very new to it. And so he's doing a great job. And uh, hopefully soon we'll be coming out and traveling around as we once did before COVID, um, coming to classrooms and libraries and bringing Zephyr here to visit everyone out in the world. But in the meantime, I want to thank you for joining us today at Audubon, Rhode Island and meeting our newest animal ambassador, Zephyr. And I hope we'll see you out on the trails soon here at Audubon. Oh, hey, they, they didn't let me leave this time. I had to stay right here. How boring. When Zephyr came to us last year, we needed to build him a special mew or cage in order to get the permits that allow us to hold on to him. And we reached out to donors and you overwhelmingly gave us the support, not only to build the mew, but also for the medical treatments that he needed to bring him to Rhode Island. And so you're gonna get to meet Zephyr in person, or should I say in Falcon, this year at Raptor Weekend on September 11th and 12th at our Nature Center in Bristol. We're looking forward to bringing that event back and I hope to see you there. At the end of our show we're gonna, tonight, we're gonna pick the winner of the golden ticket raffle. And two people are gonna join us on top of the Superman building to ban the Falcons. And every time we go up there, people ask me all kinds of questions about the Superman building. So tonight, 
Our good friend, Matt Bird, hmm, how appropriate, has produced a short video that we're going to be able to show you tonight about the history of the Superman building. But this time I'm going to talk about the Industrial Trust Building in Providence, Rhode Island. It's a building that's currently in flux. It isn't occupied. It doesn't have a very bright future. And I hope that understanding a little bit more about its really gloried past might help shed some light on improving its chances of a better future. Since its arrival in 1928, the Industrial Trust Building has been the piece of architecture most responsible for defining the Providence skyline. Even with the addition of the modern movement and the postmodern movement, the Art Deco Tower in downtown Providence and its beauty is the proudest and most iconic part of what we call Down City. Let's go back to 1928, when this new building arrived and completely transformed Providence from a quaint New England backwards-looking port city into a bustling hub of business activity, really charging forward into the modern world. The Industrial Trust Building changed the views everywhere. Providence is a city of hills, and from all of those hills, the lantern became the most highly visible thing we had in the state. So what a church spire had done in Providence for two centuries, this building was also doing, but in a much bigger way, on a much grander scale, and at a much greater height. In 1928, the future suggested faith not in the god of a church, but in this new god of business and commerce as it collected in downtown Providence. It's interesting that in that same year, in 1928, a number of prominent pieces of Providence's architecture arrived on the scene. The Lowe's Theater, which is now the Providence Performing Arts Center, Brown School of Design's College Building, were all new and really remarkable structures, but no one really cared because this industrial trust building was so much more exciting. The building is 26 stories tall, 428 feet, and it changed the skyline in such a dramatic way that it's very hard to imagine. It was the tallest thing by far in downtown Providence. At the time, it was the tallest building in the state, and it is still the tallest building in the state. It also was the third tallest building in New England. Both of these pictures of the building being constructed show the steel frame construction on the interior, that structural grid of steel. The pictures in this pullout section of the Providence Journal really help us understand how unlike everything else this building was. It was a, a real beacon, not just of tall architecture and not just of light out of the lantern at the top, but of the future. Throughout the building there is evident the lavish and successful use of materials. On entering the main banking room, this fact undoubtedly contributes to the reassuring consciousness one has of ease and well-being. Architectural Forum says, The blending of traditional and modern is so skillful, it is hard to say where one leaves off and the other begins. One might say it is empire, with a difference. To me, this picture looks very old-fashioned. It's 1928 trying to look backwards and look more antique. And yet, Architectural Forum is pointing out that it's charging forward into the modern age, but in a comfortable way. So it's very hard to remember when looking at this building that it was modern. At the top of all the columns are huge buffalo nickels to remind us that we're in a bank. The Providence Journal wrote, No visitor to the room is unimpressed by the simplicity and effectiveness of the coloring. There are three domes in the ceiling that show the days of the week, the four winds and four seasons in the center, and then the zodiac and the months. And they're beautifully painted in a really subtle but beautiful color palette. They're also in great shape. They look very much today as they did in 1928. like to band falcons? Why is the nest box on top of the Superman building? Let's hear from some banders that have actually banded falcons and from the master bander himself, Joe Zabrowski. You guys banded the peregrines how many years ago? I think it's three. Three? Three, three years. Three or four. Three, yeah. So tell me, three. what was it like? Ah, uh, it was awesome. <laughs> it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Where else would you get a chance to hold a little baby peregrine falcon? Yeah, the, the whole experience, it's worth every penny. We, when we showed up at, first of all, it's the Superman building, the old industrial national, gorgeous building that's just sitting there. And just going through the building, getting up or something. And then you get out on the ledge where the peregrines are. 
and then eventually, like Liz said, you're, you're holding this little, little fluffy baby. <coughs> it's just an amazing experience. You never get that close to any bird, never mind the peregrine falcon. I mean, and then, you know, the rest of the year when you're driving through Providence and you see one flying, you wonder if, gee, is that one of the ones we met? <laughs> it's kind so, of neat. It was a, it was a really good experience. Well, this is really going to be one of the most memorable days of my life. I've done it twice. I'll do it again if possible. It's just really, really spectacular to get up there. You know, it's like their natural habitat up there. With them flying around you and then see the little babies and get to help band them and hold them. And not that, not only that, you get to, you know, you get a first-hand glimpse of the Superman building, a tour you're never going to be able to do. That building has been closed for a decade. And uh, walk around the walkway up there, see a huge part of the state of Rhode Island from up there. The whole experience is just breathtaking and memorable. I'm telling you, it's going to be one of the most memorable days of my life, seriously. So I had been to a couple of previous um, Party for the Peregrines, which we loved, uh, but I saw that that was one, the ability to get the opportunity to ban the Peregrines was like one of the most coveted things in the auction. I thought, I'll never, never get that. <laughs> and so when they had the um, uh, auction last year and the tickets, the golden tickets, I thought, well, sure, I'll sign up for that. And then I came home from work and there was this message from Jeff saying, call me. <laughs> I was like, whoa, call you about what? <laughs> and it was so exciting to be able to have that opportunity that I thought I would never, ever, ever get. It's one of the best experiences I have. I have the photos on my phone, I still show them to people. Uh, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Um, several years ago, I was fortunate enough to be able to have a winning bid for uh, banding of the peregrines down in the Superman building in Providence, and it was such a unique experience, and it's really hard to describe the feelings that come with it. The main thing is the banding, and that's such an educational as well as very amazing experience. Um, I learned so much about the size of the bands, when they have to be placed on the legs of these uh, birds. And the main thing was to hold them. And you look at them in the sky and they're so fierce and their talons are so huge and they're very protective of their young, but their young are extremely soft and very docile. They just sit in your hand and look around and don't try and fly away or anything. It's absolutely amazing and to think that I'm one of the few people probably in the world that's been able to actually hold a peregrine falcon is just amazing to me. And I highly recommend, if you ever have the opportunity, do it. So. Okay, Joe. So we're banning peregrines again this year. And I wanna tell everybody why we do this? Like, why is it important to ban these peregrines? Well, banding is uh, really the only way to follow the birds, to identify the bird, a particular bird. The banding provides information to any number of people, scientists, researchers, on migration habits, uh, behavioral habits, uh, longevity, how long they live. For example, uh, we just recently received a report from New Jersey of one of our birds that was banded, and we would have never known that if that bird hadn't been banded. So we started this in 2010. When did we start banding? The year 2000 uh, was the first nesting, and we and it was a banding in the year 2000. See, I did not do that banding. Michael Amaral, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, did that banding. Um, Ten years ago, I, I began banding the peregrines. And I've been involved with banding 61 different nestlings. And why have we put the nest on the Superman building? Well, I researched several buildings in the year 1996. And uh, the Superman building was the one that fit the criteria uh, for, for a nest box. There were 31 different criteria that I looked at to determine which building to use, uh, which way the building was facing, and which way the nest box would face, the height of the building. And it just so happened, the recommendation for height was 30 stories, and that's exactly where it is, at 30 stories. So all of the suitable elements for a peregrine nesting were, were right there at the Superman building.
So when we ban these birds, do they migrate south or do they stick around the area? Well, the adult birds are there for year, year round. It's a matter of uh, having food and uh, a safe place, uh, the proper habitat, and, and everything is there, so the adults stay. The young ones will leave in August and uh, just go off. It's hard to, again, determine where they go unless they are seen, unless the band is, is uh, identified. Probably the most extensive migration for an East End peregrine is about 500 miles. The young ones are gone and they won't come back. In fact, uh, the adults wouldn't uh, allow them back, so. Why? <laughs> it's their territory. <laughs> they're, no. they're not going to give it up. I wish I could do that to my kids. Yeah. So they nest, they're in the box, they fly off. Where do they go? Like, I, I see them on the bridge sometimes. No, uh, when they when they first leave the nest box, when they take their first flight, they'll be in the city for uh, a month or more, you know, learning habits of hunting and uh, survival. And, and, the, and the parents, after the nesting season is over, where are they hanging out? They stay right in the city. They really? don't. They don't leave. But they don't come back to the nesting box. No, they, they'll they'll stay away from the nesting box. There's no no need for them to be there. They just no. They won't come back. Get out of the they, rain. They'll be in the city and they'll find their own place to stay and uh, in a sheltered area. And, but uh, they don't use a nest box again. What can people expect when they go up there with us to band? What they can expect is uh, something that they'll never experience again in their life. It's a, it's a very unique experience. I've been you know, doing this for 20 years. I get excited every time I go up. So uh, it really is a spectacle. Yeah. Awesome. Well, come band with us this year. See Joe in action. This is it. We've come to the end of the auction. We're going to count down and close the auction with the help of some very special friends of mine. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for supporting the Audubon Society and our animal ambassadors. Thank you so much for all of your support. Thank you for everything. Thank you for joining us for this year's Party for the Peregrines. Thank you for all your support. The birds say thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for supporting Audubon and the Party for the Peregrines. Ten. Nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Yahoo! Yahoo! The auction is over! You know, it's just not the same when you're doing this by yourself. It's not as, as much energy. I hope you won, and if you didn't, Maybe now's the time to go to that donate button and use the money that you were going to spend and make a donation to the Falcons. Hey, I'm the fundraiser. What do you expect? All the money we raise tonight is going to go to help support our Raptor Care program, so please be as generous as you can tonight. Now, the moment you have all been waiting for, we are going to select the winner of the golden ticket. And for this, I need the help from my dear friend, Paige Theron, with Paige's magic spinny winner picker thingy. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And thank you to everyone who has participated in the auction, and of course, to everyone who bought a golden ticket. We had 86 participants in the raffle. They bought 117 tickets for a grand total of $5,850 raised. So thank you so much. All right. Here we go. Congratulations, Ray Brown. Hey, congratulations. I'm gonna call you next week. Right now, we're expecting the band around sometime after the 25th, but I'll call you next week some details. You're gonna keep two days open. It's gonna be 10 o'clock in the morning. Can't wait to see you. And that's it. Another and hopefully the last virtual Party for the Peregrines is in the record books. I want to tell you how extremely grateful all of us here at Audubon are for your support, whether it's a contribution, whether it's calling your state rep when nature needs your voice, or if you're one of the many volunteers that help us do our work. 
I'd like to do a shout out to several people who helped make tonight possible. Mary Edsel. Mary joined as an intern, and I'm sure Mary had no clue what she was getting herself into, but she's basically put this entire program tonight together for us. Mary, you're awesome. Jen Medeiros, she made the calls, she did the pickups, she put all the items together on the, on the auction site. Jen, you rock. To my colleagues, Julius Lundy, and Julius will take in all your money tonight, and Paige Theron, who did the magic spinny thing, and also made it possible for you even to learn about the party. She, she takes care of all our social media and our emails and our communications, and she's just great. And finally, a mega shout out to all the businesses, all the organizations that made a contribution to our auction. You can't do an auction without stuff. And we got some pretty good stuff tonight. So if you go to one of the restaurants or you're at a museum or you see any of our donors, please thank them for making tonight possible and making it possible for us to take care of these magnificent birds. Okay, mark your calendars. We'll be having our 20th anniversary on the 21st year, thank you, COVID, uh, of the Nature Center on August 7th. It's gonna be a garden party. So we, invitations will be going out soon. We hope we'll see you there. Get ready for Raptor Weekend, September 11th and 12th. From me and everybody here at Audubon, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for supporting Audubon. And I hope to see you out on the trails. Good night, everybody.